So, you're curious. Why are we attracted to certain things? What makes them attractive to us as humans? What is it that's appealing about them? Why, for example, is she more appealing than she is? It's not the reason you think. For example, why is this sports car considered sexy? And this spaceship, totally not. Stick around and you're gonna find out. My name is Eric Strebel. I'm an industrial designer. Welcome to my channel about product design and making. I hope that you like, enjoy, and become a subscriber. Check this out. I just found out that my sponsor, PCBWay, has custom colors for their solder masks for your PCBs, including the red, the green, the yellow, the blue, the white, the black, the purple, matte green, and of course, badass matte black. Click the link below for your custom colors for your PCBs. Part of being an industrial designer is trying to design beautiful things. After all, we're trying to convince our clients that if you're going to manufacture something, you might as well make it attractive or beautiful so that you can sell more of them. So in order to understand what makes things beautiful, you need to understand proportions because it doesn't matter how beautiful you make something if your proportions suck, meaning you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. So the basics of proportions here <clears throat> of these three objects that I've put together is the basis for everything that we do to try to make beautiful things. The bottom element was the dominant element. This vertical element is what we call the subdominant element. And the top element that pierces that is called the subordinate. There's a relationship that exists between these three elements. And this relationship is what makes things beautiful. So let's learn a little bit about this relationship. These relationships between these three elements, they relate to each other in a certain kind of way. So I've put them together in a way that makes them attractive and gives them gesture. Yes, these three boxes have gesture and movement. So they all have a major axis that runs through them. And they're all, in this case, happen to be the three major axes, the X, Y, and Z axis. So we have everything kind of covered here. When we put all these axes together, it allows our eye to flow from the top to the bottom and you get a gesture. You need to have some gesture to make things beautiful. Your eye needs to flow and not just sit in one spot like you would, let's say, like with a cube. Just bear with me and I'll explain. There are, of course, more things to making something beautiful than just the proportions, but you need to get the proportions right. There are color, texture, materials, all those things come into play. But we need to understand the basic proportions of things so that we can understand if they're attractive or not. So let's take an everyday object, in this case a Ford F-150, and break it down and identify the major proportions and see how beautiful it is based on these proportions and their relationship to each other. So in the middle we have the dominant and in the back is the subdominant and in the front is the subordinate. Proportions, in this case, mm, not so great. The subdominant in the back and the cab in the middle, mm, they're too similar. Let's take a look at an extended cab. So this gives us a bigger dominant section to start with. Subdominant in the back and subordinate in the front. This is much better, the relationship between the middle, the back, and the front. So these three basic pieces are in this everyday truck and they work 
halfway decent. Maybe one of the reasons Ford sells a whole bunch of these things. Hmm, just maybe. Part of it. Who knows? Yeah, it has something to do with it. This is a top view, just to give you an idea that as you move around an object, proportions and relationships change. This is important. You want to make an object that is beautiful 360. So no matter how you look at it, it's always beautiful. You say, Eric, hmm, not everything is made up of three boxes. I say, yeah, true, you're right. In this case, this little car has two boxes. You need to understand the relationship of those two boxes and the relationship between them. The bottom box is just a little bit bigger than the top box. I'm showing you how you could break it up another way, but this is not being sensitive to the form. The form goes in a horizontal manner and you need to be sensitive to that when you take a look at this. You say, what about the wheels? Hmm, I say, in this case, ornamentation. They also could be uh, the subordinates, maybe, if you want them to be. <clears throat> so, I mentioned something about a cube. Mm, cube's not that exciting. All the sides are the same. There's no relationship between one side of the cube and another side of the cube. All the edges in this cube are the same. So that relationship is mm, average. So, a much more attractive shape would be something that was maybe a little more rectangular. So let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna sketch out a quick rectangular kind of shape. And it's still a box, but it's just not square. So meaning all the sides aren't the same. They have different proportions, the sides. You wanna at least try to get these sides to have some sort of nice relationship to each other. So you have length, width, and height. And this gives you dominant on the bottom here, or this length, it's actually the top surface, subdominant, I'm breaking it down and just simplifying just the edges, but they would be these surfaces on the top, the end, and then on the side. Let's take a look at some other cars and how we might break them up. This is a new Audi concept SUV. So the dominant form here is in the middle of the car. A little unusual for a car, but it's kind of what makes it cool. And the upper becomes the subdominant, and then the bottom becomes the subordinate. I toss the wheels out. They're kind of like ornamentation to me for this vehicle, just like the roof rack is. Kind of like jewelry that you would see. Um, it's just decorative. I mean, I realize that the wheels are part of the stance and give it part of its character and everything, but it's not about the wheels. It's about the proportions of the rest of the vehicle, in my opinion. You say, Eric, hmm, those things are all kind of boxy, easy to identify. Let's try something a little more organic. Let's take a look at this McLaren F1 and how the proportions break out here. The main back of the body from the wheels back the dominant part of the form. The upper greenhouse becomes the subdominant, and then the nose area here becomes the subordinate. Nice relationship between all three of those elements. The same thing happens here with this Lamborghini Countach. The bottom is the dominant, the upper is the subdominant, and the front is the subordinate. The wing, the wheels, hmm, jewelry, accents, whatever you want to call them. You could toss them in to the other elements and it wouldn't really change anything. Same here with this 911, classic kind of proportions, never really goes out of style. Porsche doesn't mess with that stuff too much. Let's take a look at this Aston Martin and the proportions are set up a little bit different here. So the dominant element becomes all, goes from the front all the way back to the rear wheels where you get the subdominant and the upper becomes the subordinate. We have different gesture, different movement of this vehicle, uh, and the proportions are broken up in a different kind of way. You say, eh, that's nice. Those are all sports cars. Of course they're all sexy. How does that apply to a regular everyday average vehicle? Hmm, simple. 
Take a look at this Ford C-Max here. Dominant body on the lower, subdominant upper, subordinate front end. Nice, good little proportions. Let's take a look at some really bad vehicles over the year. General Motors, mm, kind of the king of bad vehicles. They are particularly good at screwing up the proportions here. So EV1, dominant bottom, way too big. And the subordinate and the subdominant elements are too close in visual weight to each other. So it just doesn't work. They fight each other. They're clashing. It's terrible. Let's take a look at another famous General Motors vehicle, Pontiac Aztec. I'm so sorry. It really was terrible. Besides all that cladding on the bottom, the dominant, subdominant, mm, they just don't work with each other. Their proportions are terrible. The dominant and the subdominant, again, too close in value. That dominant is just no good. The upper, too big. Toyota Prius, same thing. Terrible. How can you screw up these basic proportions on a vehicle? Seriously, you need to twist engineering's arm a little bit more and make beautiful vehicles. Stop making vehicles with terrible proportions. The dominant form here is way too dominant. Car is nasty. Unless you don't want to make beautiful things. So let's take a look at the next generation Enterprise. Oh, good God. What was the designer thinking? Clearly didn't know anything about proportions. And then you got a director who didn't know shit about proportions either. And you get this ugh, monstrosity of a spaceship. Absolutely terrible. Just awful. Let's take another vehicle from this same universe. So this is Star Trek Voyager, and the proportions here are better. The upper dominant, much better relationship to the subdominant main body underneath of it. You can't see all of it. And then the subordinate pods on each end. In the Star Wars universe, <clears throat> ships tend to be a little bit better for the most part. This uh, X-wing here, dominant body, Wings, subdominance, and these little elements on the end are subordinates. It's decent. The Naboo ship here, eh, it's also okay. Not as bad as the Enterprise. Acceptable. Let's take a look at the SR-71, arguably the coolest airplane ever built. I'm not really sure there was any industrial designers that worked on this project, mainly engineers. So they either got super lucky or Kelly Johnson had a pretty good eye for basic proportions. I think he got lucky all the way around. It's pretty awesome. Pretty good for getting lucky. All right, let's take a look at some everyday objects that we use as humans. These Coke bottles. Yes, the ones in the middle, designed, the first one there that I circled, designed by Raymond Lowy, industrial designer. Probably had a pretty good idea what he was doing. So let's break down the proportions of this Coke bottle. Dominant part here in the middle, where you grab your hand, makes it nice to hold. The bottom is the subdominant, and this little subordinate piece at the top. Arguably, this was probably the best looking Coke bottle ever made. And they still sort of make it today, right? Now this is the plastic version of the current Coke bottle. Terrible. Absolutely horrific. You got this big, huge honking piece at the bottom. You got this piece in the middle where they need to stick a label. So it, it's just awful. The two components, dominant and subdominant elements here, are too close to each other. They fight each other. It's not good. It's not attractive. It needs to be fixed. Whatever. Take a look at this water carafe here from uh, WMF. Beautiful proportions. We got this dominant piece on the bottom, subdominant here at the top, and then this little subordinate uh, top element at the top. Very nice, very classy, very elegant. So. How does this all apply to humans? 
Why do we like the human form so much? Let's break down the human form. We got the core or the upper, including the arms, which is the dominant part of the human body. The bottom part with the legs is the subdominant and the head is the subordinate. Males are a little more chunky, so uh, their proportions are a little bit different for a female, but they still are broken out in the same way. So dominant in the main torso part, subdominant for the legs, and for females, the legs are a little bit longer, and then the head, and they tend to have that beautiful flowing hair, which you need to add in there. So same basic layout, but the proportions are slightly different. One obviously a little more masculine, a little more chunky, a little bit more military, rugged, where the female form is a little bit smoother, sexier, so to say. So let's figure out why one of these females has better proportions than the other. Let's break it out. So we'll take her main torso, add her arms to it to give us our dominant part of the form. And we're going to add her legs. And we will have that relationship between the dominant and the subdominant where we have a nice proportion. They are not even. And we will add all of her hair to the subordinate element in the top to give us this very nice relationship. Let's analyze the same thing in this female where we take her arms and we'll add that to her uh, main torso and we get quite the large visual mass. And we compare that to the lower part of her body and her legs basically have too much mass. So that relationship between the dominant and the subdominant, they are competing against each other. It's not a nice visual relationship between the two. You need to have some balance there where you have a nice relationship to get something beautiful. That's how designers break down objects so that we have beautiful proportions and we can build on those proportions for whatever object it is that we're designing. This comes through some training and some development and over time through some practice to understand these relationships to make beautiful objects. Hope you liked the video, learned something. Leave a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. Thanks for your support. Hey, and don't forget to follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook sometimes, Twitter usually, and now Instagram. Rock on. Click here to check out some of the other design and making videos that I have that you might enjoy.